Hi, this is Mr. Heichel. I'm here, I'm bringing you a um, three-part series on mastering the biology star test. So we're going to use this as a review. I'm going to go over each question. We're going to talk about the content needed to answer each question. We're going to talk about the questions and the answers, and maybe we can find some commonality to help us come up with the correct answer if we don't exactly know what content they're trying to, um, to get from us there. So question one says, the picture shows a student using a microscope to study a prepared slide of a single cell organism. So then we go on, we keep reading, and we can see that we can see that a single cell organism can be classified as a prokaryote based on the absence of well, I already have some notes here for what I would think whenever I had this question. Okay, I would think there's a prokaryotic cell and there's a eukaryotic cell. So I know that karyote means nucleus. And I know that pro, at least in science, means no. And u means true. So if we have a eukaryotic cell, we have a true nucleus. If we have a prokaryotic cell, we have no nucleus. Well, that's our answer. So it's prokaryote because it does not have a nucleus. But another key bit of information we need to know on this question is that a single-celled organism can be classified as a prokaryote based on the absence of. Well, these three things, a cell membrane, a ribosome, and chromosomes, whether it be DNA or RNA, some kind of genetic information, is going to be contained within all of these cells. So a prokaryotic and a eukaryotic cell are all going to have cell membranes, ribosomes, and chromosomes. So again, the correct answer is nucleus. Prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. So that brings us to question number two. And I kind of messed up on this earlier, so I'm going to redo it on the back of this paper. So we have two different types of mutations. So it says different types of mutations can occur in DNA. The diagram represents a type of mutation. So we're going to rewrite both strands of our DNA. So we're going to start with... Let me scoot this up a little bit so you can see it. So we're going to have... G, A, C. Write them in triplets or in codons. And then put the little dash mark beside them so you don't get them confused. That's the way I do it. You don't have to do it that way. But I figured, I've discovered that it helps if you split it up. So then we got T, A, A, G, C, A, C. So right away, we already know that we have an insertion mutation because we have one extra letter. So this right here is where the, the, the insertion occurred. So we went from TAG to TAA. So that's an insertion. And it's also what you might hear called a frame shift because it shifts the reading frame of these codons over to the right. So then let's look at our answers and let's come up with the right answer. A silent mutation results in an insertion of a different amino acid. Well, we're not inserting amino acids here. We're inserting um, mRNA or DNA. A substitution occurs with the adenine base. Well, we didn't substitute an adenine base. We um, insert it. We didn't delete. So J is the only logical answer. A base is inserted into one DNA strand our insertion incurred here. So another type of mutation that you need to be familiar with is a point mutation. So a point mutation occurs at only one point. So for example, we could have, um, let's do GAC, TAG, let's just rewrite the other one, CAC, and then let's rewrite one with a point mutation. So we have GAC, Instead of writing TAG, let's write TAC and then CAC. So this right here would be our point mutation. It occurs just on one of the codons. Nothing before the codon is affected, nothing after the codon is affected. The only thing that could be infected in a point mutation is um, the amino acid might change. Or it could stay the same because there are multiple codons that make the same amino acid sometimes. So let's go on to... Um, Let's get to the next question, question number three. So it says a remora is a fish with an adhesive disc on the back of its head that it uses to attach itself to a large shark. When food floats away from the shark's mouth as it feeds, the remora collects the scraps, 
drawings of a shark with her mora are shown below. So that paragraph is just a lot of fluff, and it kind of explains the relationship between the shark and the remora fish. So let's break down the relationships that we have when we talk about ecological relationships. So predation. Think about predation as where one of the individuals benefits, the other one is affected. So this would be a lion chasing down a gazelle and eating the gazelle. So the lion would benefit because it gets food, the gazelle obviously would be affected because it would be killed. So predation and parasitism are very, very similar. One benefits, the other one's affected, but parasitism isn't necessarily hunting and killing. It's more of a of a flea attacking a dog or a tick. Let's say you're walking in the woods and you get bit by a tick. Well, that tick gets food from you and you could potentially be affected by it. They could give you Lyme disease or rickets disease. Okay, so commensalism is where one benefits, so we're going to put a plus sign, and the other one doesn't care. So this remora fish is getting food from the shark, but the shark could care less. So something you very commonly see here in Central Texas is um, the, those white birds that fly around the cows, they're called egrets. So those egrets are actually eating the flies from the cows when they're stirring up insects and bugs in the grass as the cows are walking through it, and the cows could care less that they're there. So then let's break down the other one. Uh, we got competition. Competition affects both. So let's say you're a small lion. Well, you're going up against a big lion and you're competing for food. You both could be affected. One of you is not going to get the food. The other one could be killed or hurt or injured. So competition doesn't benefit really anybody in this case. So let's go on to question number four. Question number four. Invasive plant species affect the interactions of living and non-living components of an ecosystem. So the removal of invasive plants is often necessary. The goal most plant control methods is to disrupt or inhibit the function of different plant systems. For example, insects can be used to chew through the roots in order to reduce a plant's ability to absorb water. Which of these functions would most immediately be affected by the reduction of water uptake by the roots? Okay, well, we know the roots give the plants water. Simple enough, okay? So let's figure out what system is is uh, dealing with water. And it, it is going to be photosynthesis, but let's talk about it. So disease resistant has nothing to do with water. Okay? Seed dispersal has nothing to do with water. Sunlight absorption could be because it would affect photosynthesis, but photosynthesis, the two things you need to know about photosynthesis is it needs carbon dioxide and it needs water. So it needs water to take place. If, if there's no water present, the plant dies. It can't grow without water, and it, and it can't grow without carbon dioxide. So it needs both of those products to make, you know, the glucose, right? Because that's what's made in photosynthesis, which is C6H12O6. And then it also makes something very important that is humans need. And um, it also makes oxygen. So it gives us the oxygen in the air that we breathe that we need to survive. So water would be the reason that is the correct answer because it has to have water for photosynthesis to take place. Question number five. So we got a paragraph here. We got a lot of reading. The picture shows a pika, a small mammal found in the grassland ecosystems. The vast grasslands of the Tibetan Plateau are, are home to the Plateau pika. The numerous pika are prey for many predators of grasslands which serve as a major watershed for much of the area. The watershed drains large quantities of groundwater during the rainy season or the, moon, the monsoon season. Pikas have extensive burrows that help drain groundwater rapidly and are used as nesting sites by many bird species. However, many people advocate for the eradication of the plateau pikas because they compete with livestock for grass. Which of these will most likely happen if the plateau pikas are completely removed from the Tibetan plateau grasslands? So there's a lot of information going on in this question, and probably the reason most people miss this question is because they don't, they don't feel like reading it. 
if, if I had a time test and, you know, I had, you know, you got four hours to answer 54 questions, I may put a star by this one and read over it and then come back to it because I don't want to spend the time and the effort and the energy on it. This is where looking for like answers in the question and like answers in the um, actual paragraph above it come in very, very handy. So, it is question number A is the correct answer, but let's look at some of the similarities. So, this says nesting sites. Well, we have nesting sites up here. This also says downriver. This is talking about groundwater and river. And it also says monsoon rains. And it says monsoon season up here. So that is why I picked A right off the bat. There are some other similarities in here, um, but A is going to be your best answer. The ecosystem will become unstable because predators will have fewer prey. So the predators aren't going to be able to eat this guy, so they're going to go prey on something else. The birds will have fewer nesting sites because the pikas make the nesting sites for the birds. And then the area downriver become more vulnerable to flooding because they won't have these burrows to provide them with adequate draining, like the, like the paragraph said. So again, if you can find like answers, or like words in the answer choices, and like words in the question, nine times out of ten, that's going to be your best answer to go with. Because you're not always going to know all the answers and know all the content, but if you can match words with word from question and answer, nine times out of ten, you can come up with the right answer. So this takes us to question number six. And we are a third of the way done for part one. I know, it's really fun. Albinism is autosomal recessive. So which circle graph shows the genotype probability when an albino female mates with a male that is heterozygous for albinism? Okay, so there's a lot of information going on in this question. So recessive, that's our first word. So, recessive has to be two little letters for it to be recessive. For a recessive trait to be displayed, the genotype has to be two little letters. So we got genotype and we got phenotype. So phenotype is the physical appearance of the trait. So the phenotype for this would be albinism. So that means white skin, red eyes. Okay? Okay, so we've got genotype, we've got phenotype. And then we got heterozygous. So heterozygous means different. So big A, little a, this would be hetero. And then we could have big A, big A, and that would also be, that would be homo dominant, right? So homo is the same, hetero is different. So now let's just do a simple Punnett square, and, and we'll figure it out. All right, so we've got, a female says a female who has it. So in order for her to have it, she has to be two little A's. And then it says that it has a male that is heterozygous. So heterozygous simply means big A, little a. So then let's let's pull this A across. Let's pull this down, across and down. So we've got 50% big A, little a, and 50% little a, little a, or graph number F, letter F. So you have to know how to do a basic Punnett square on this, and it does it for you, and you get the right answer. Part of the cell cycle is shown in the simplified model. This part of the cell cycle is best described as the process that does what? So let's look at the cell cycle. You have mitosis, you have prophase, which is kind of the first. You've got meta, which is then winding up in the middle. You have anaphase, where the uh, chromatid are pulled apart. All right. Then you've got telophase, which they're at the poles fully apart. And then the last step is cyto. Kinesis. 
which Saito means cell, so we get two new cells from one. So this is cytokinesis essentially broken down. So this is probably as close to telophase as this picture is going to show. And then we've got this little cleavage furrows that's going to be pinched off and you're going to get two new cells forming from one cell. So this would be completes the cell division cycle or letter B. So again, you've got prophage, which is kind of a cell being a cell. The nuclear envelope breaks down. It's ready to undergo cell division or the process of mitosis and or meiosis. So you got metaphase where the chromosome or the chromatids kind of line up in the middle. Uh, anaphase is where the chromatids are slightly pulled apart. They're starting to, to, to mitigate towards the, the poles. Telophase, they're fully opposite sides of the cells they can possibly get. And then cytokinesis, as the cell's going to pinch off, it's going to form that cleavage furrow, and it's going to become two new cells from one cell. So let's move on to question eight. We're flying right along. Question number eight. It says, TAC polymerase is an enzyme. Let's stop right there. We know that polymerase is an enzyme because it, it, it ends in an ASE. So anytime something ends in ASE, it's automatically, 100% of the time, an enzyme. Used in polymerase chain reaction to replicate fragments of DNA. A study published in 1976 examined the properties of TAC polymerase after the enzyme was isolated from Thermus aquatus, a thermophilic bacteria that lives in the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. The graph shows one of the results of the study. Before I even look at the questions, this graph is talking about enzyme activity and heat. So, if I don't know anything else about the graph, I know it's talking about enzyme activity and it's talking about heat or temperature. So let's look at the answer choices. An enzyme must be composed of multiple polypeptides or subunits to be active. It doesn't say anything about that in the question. Nothing. So the graph, it says the graph. By this graph. This graph is only talking about enzyme activity and temperature. Okay, an enzyme's rate of activity increases with time until it becomes inactive. It doesn't say anything about that. But it does say that an enzyme function best under specific temperatures. Talking about enzyme activity, which is the same thing as enzyme function. And we can see that it functions best at a specific temperature. It's still working here, just not very well. Temperature, temperature, enzyme function, enzyme activity. Both of those words are described in the graph. So your correct answer has to be, it has to be H. It's going to be every single time. Find the like, like words in the question to like words in the answer. Match them together if you don't know anything else about it. Number nine is another example of this. So the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, often infects and destroys CD4 T cells. These CD4 T cells are one of many kinds of white blood cells that are an important part of the immune system. So the most common danger related to the destruction of these CDT, CD4 T cells is what? Okay. Immune system, immunodeficiency. So, what does our immune system do? So, our immune system fights off viruses and bacteria. It keeps us healthy. All right? The immune system is responsible for keeping us healthy. It fights off viruses and bacteria. Okay. It doesn't say anything about blood pressure doesn't say anything about decreasing blood flow and it doesn't say anything about decreasing the amount of oxygen anywhere in here. Oxygen is related to red blood cells. So our correct answer has to be B because we know our immune system deals with microorganisms which are bacteria and viruses. Has to be B. So again, look for common words if you don't know anything else about any of this content. Find common words between the question and the answer. More often than not, you're going to get it right. Number 10. All right. Common baboons live on the savanna in breeding groups called troops. While females tend to stay within the troops, 
younger or less dominant males may leave to join a neighboring troop. Which of these is a likely outcome of movement of young males? All right, so we've got gene flow, allele frequencies, relative genome frequencies reach a constant state, or immediate phenotype increases in the species. So let's think about this. All right, we've got some group of people over here that are X's. Okay, we got a group of people over here that are O's. All right, well, this says some of these younger ones are going to leave. They're going to go over here. So these two are going to go over here. So then they're going to reproduce, and they're going to have X's and O's sometimes, and then they're going to have some O's. So that's gene flow, because think about if this is a Hispanic population, and this is a white com or population, so you're going to have a few Hispanics breed with a few whites, or Caucasians, and then you're going to get a mixture of their genes within it. So these could be red flowers, and these could be white flowers, and these XO's down here could be pink flowers. So that's gene flow that's going to occur between the two populations. That's the only thing that you're going to be able to see quickly. An estuary collects sediments from the ocean and rivers that feed into it. These sediments swirl around and then settle to form a mudflat. Eel grass is then established on the mudflat. The ecosystem changes over time and ultimately develops into a salt marsh that contains mangrove trees. Which of the following is not is likely not involved in this example of ecological secession? Not is the key word. So let's read it. Say the rotten remains of the plants add to the fertility of the soil. Well, we know that that's what happens. It's part of the nitrogen and carbon cycles. So when things die, they fertilize the grass for next generations. The soil becomes so, so fertile that the eel grass is replaced. Okay, well that happens too. Think about think about a field that just burned down. Okay, the first thing to come back is going to be the grass. Once there's enough mature grass, then you're going to get small shrubs, small bushes, small trees, and then over time everything is going to be stable. You're going to have grass, bigger brush, bigger bushes, bigger trees, and everything's going to be in place. So roots from the plants help stabilize the sediment. Yes. So this is another one of those where you can also find the word in the answer and in the question. So we have salt. We have salt. But we know that the concentration of salt becomes so high that all plant lives are destroyed. It doesn't say anything about the salt destroying anything. It just says that over time, it develops into a salty marsh that contains mango trees. Salt can, our water can grow in salt water. So there's things that can grow in salt water. Number 12, differences in traits, such as hair texture, are determined by the differences in what? So let's look at this. All right, so when we've got DNA. We have, we've got a phosphate joined to a sugar, joined to a nitrogen base. Okay, so this, let's call that A, and let's do another T, C, G. Well, this pattern essentially repeats itself. Okay, so we have a sugar phosphate backbone that never changes. It always is a phosphate, then a sugar, then a phosphate, then a sugar. Well, each one of these is a nucleotide, and you're going to have a nitrogen base. It's the sequence of these nitrogen bases that makes all living things on Earth different. So plants have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, just like humans do. Monkeys, dogs, cats, we all have the same basic four letters. It is the sequence of those nucleotides that is going to make us different. Because the sugar doesn't change, the molecule attached to the phosphate is always going to be a sugar, so that doesn't change. The number can change, but just because you have more doesn't mean it's doing anything. It's the sequence of the nucleotides that makes all living things different. A lucky number 13. Let's see what we got. All right. Students were given a list of seven elements and asked to identify the four elements that were most abundant in biomolecules. Which table correctly identifies the four most abundant elements and biomolecules. This is one you just have to know. 
it's it's one of those ones where your teacher probably told you to remember schnapps. At least I told my kids to remember schnapps. So schnapps, in order, is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. That's the abundance, in order from least to most. Okay, well, let's figure out which chart has those in it. it it's going to be A, because we have carbon. Check. We have hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Okay. Well, we have hydrogen. We have all, all four of them here, but carbon's left off, so it can't be that one. It doesn't say anything about fluorine down here, and then it doesn't say anything about iodine down here. So it has to be A. Schnapps. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. In that order, from most abundant to least abundant. Schnapps. 14, right away. Before I even read the question on this graph, my eyes are going to be attracted to those. The graph shows the number of taxa of reptiles who fossilized tracks have been found. Which statement is best supported by this data? Okay, so letter choice F says competition for food and shelter among the reptile species were low during the Jurassic period. It doesn't look like they were. It looked like Jurassic. They had a bloom. They had a exponential growth. They went from 25 taxa to over 100. Let's say 110 taxa. Okay. So that brings us to the right answer of G. A great extinction occurred in the Jurassic period. Well, if we go a little, if we look at the Jurassic period, we go from over 130 different taxa down to 15. So 120 taxa disappeared off the face of the earth during the Jurassic period. So that's our right answer. But let's rule out these other two so we know they're not right. Environmental conditions for speciation were most favorable during the Permian period. Well, we didn't really get a whole lot of differentiation in species, so it can't be that. And then reptiles adapted to a terrestrial environment during the Crustaceous period. Well, Crustaceous typically means water, not terrestrial. But again, we don't know because it just tells us the number. It doesn't tell us where they're living and reptiles and all this. We assume reptiles live in the water and the land equally, but we don't necessarily know that. Fifteen. This one's a tricky one. This is probably the most difficult one we've had so far. So, the picture shows bean-shaped glands called nodes. The cluster of cells in nodes These cluster of cells and nodes includes macrophages that break down viruses and other potentially harmful materials. Nodes also contain cells that produce protein particles capable of capturing harmful materials that flow in and out of the tissue through the nodes. During the parts of the body, different parts of the body are drained by nodes in different regions of the body. Which body systems are directly responsible for regulating these nodes and protecting the body from harmful materials in tissue fluids. Okay, well let's go back up to the question. There's, there's, there's a few key words that we can focus on here. So when you go to the doctor and let's say you got strep throat or some kind of viral or bacterial infection, they feel right beneath your chin, they feel your neck. Well, the, where they're feeling is called your lip nodes. So right away when you hear the word node, you should think lymphatic. Lymphatic. Because you have lymph nodes. So if those are inflamed, chances are that your body is trying to isolate those bacteria within those lymph nodes so that it's easier for your immune system to capture harmful materials, which is what your immune system does. So that takes us to A. You had to know a little bit about your body systems to get this one right, but not a whole lot if you know 
basic biology and you know that you have lymph nodes that capture things and that your immune system destroys all of those things. So that takes us to question number 16. 16. This diagram demonstrates why the ocean is a large carbon sink. So that means if carbon goes into the ocean, we typically don't get it back. It disappears. So we've got all this stuff. We got all this precipitation, wind, and sunlight. And it says we got a layer of sea ice, and this is where the sink of the carbon dioxide occurs. It sinks down to the bottom. Um, cold water holds more CO2, warm water holds less. A little bit of it escapes back into the atmosphere. And then you also have circulation it mixes up from the very, very deeps of the ocean to the very, very top of the ocean. Okay, so. The question then goes on to say, an increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can cause atmospheric temperatures to increase. Which statement explains how this would affect the ocean as a carbon sink? So we want to find an answer choice that has atmosphere and then maybe the word temperature in it or increasing temperature or something like that. Temperature to increase. So less atmospheric pressure, or less atmospheric carbon dioxide would be available. That's a statement. That's not an explanation. We want something to explain it. Dissolve carbon dioxide gas in the ocean would increase surface winds. No, it has nothing to do with that. Less carbon dioxide would be contained in the ocean because increasing precipitation would dilute. No, it has nothing to do with that. But we know that temperature Temperatures listed right here. Increasing atmospheric temperature. Okay, it's also right there. These words. Same words. Increasing atmospheric temperature, temperatures to increase. Same words. J is the right answer. <coughs> Sorry, there's some cats getting in the fight under my feet. Seventeen. Which molecule synthesized by plants is a major source of energy in cellular processes in both plants and animals? So we know molecules synthesized by plants. So let's go back to the photosynthesis equation. We know we have carbon dioxide and we add water to it and we produce what's called glucose or C6H12 O6, and then we also, those plants also going to make some oxygen. So which one of those is synthesized? Synthesizes means made, so the only one that's made is, is, is glucose. So if you know this reaction, you should get every cellular respiration and every photosynthesis question right, because remember cellular respiration is just the reverse of this. Humans, we eat sugar, we breathe in oxygen, we make carbon dioxide for the plants, and we breathe out water vapor. I think it takes us to our last two questions, I believe, for the day. And then we'll be getting to parts two and three a little bit later. So researchers combine the sequences of a fruit fly DNA from a gene for a particular trait with frog DNA. The mixture was heated to separate the DNA strands. Cooling allowed the single strand to form pairs. The researchers observed that some of the fruit fly DNA paired with some of the frog DNA. So what they did is they extracted fruit fly DNA, frog DNA, they heated it up, they recombined it, and they got a mixture of both. So it says the results provide evidence of that. Well, we talked on this a few, a few questions ago that all living organisms have the same nucleotides. It's just a sequence of the nucleotides that, um, that are different. So our A's, our T's, our C's, and our G's are a little bit different. So, let's use that information to answer this question. And it is going to be F. F is going to be the right answer. Similar nucleotides are present in both fruit fly and frog DNA. But, let's look at these um, other answer choices to make sure that that's the best answer. So, fruit flies and frogs can be made to develop some of the same physical traits. It doesn't say anything about that in the question, so that can't be right. Heat can cause mutations in the DNA sequences of organisms. That can be possible, but it's not talking about anything about that up here. 
and then the replication of genetic material can occur at any temperature. Okay, well, if, if um, your body is in a certain temperature, you die, so then your DNA is not being replicated anymore. You get too hot, you die, so then your body can't produce it. But that's, that's a stretch because it's really not mentioned in anything up here. We don't know how hot they heated it or how they cooled it off. So let's go with F. Similar nucleotides are present in both fruit flies because all living organisms have the same basic nucleotides. We all have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. It's just the, um, the combination or the sequence of those that um, makes us uniquely who we are. From a single fertilized ovum, ovum is egg, produced in the ovaries, undergoing a series of rapid cell divisions, a human infant develops. Okay, that's what happens. The embryonic cells become specialized for a variety of functions. Which of these statements best describes how different cell types develop? So when your body undergoes developmental uh, growth within your mom's womb, you have cells that become your liver cells and your kidney cells and hair cells and skin cells and every little cell in your body is specialized. So they become, they do a specific trait. So they all start off with the same basic DNA and then they get these specific enzymes or expression traits or genes that tell them what they're going to do. So, each cell type, no, because each cell contains all of your DNA. One cell contains all of your DNA that your body needs. Each cell type only has chromosomes, no, nope. so each cell type has an identical copy of DNA, yes, with enzymes controlling the expression, yes. C is our right answer, let's see why D is not. Each cell has multiple copies of DNA that are affected in different ways. No, each cell only has one copy of your DNA. So that is part one of three for the uh, how to pass the star test that we got coming up um, this year. So sorry for the few disruptions. The cats were fighting. I don't know why they were fighting. Um, but I will be back in a few days and bring you parts two and parts three of Tackling the Star with Mr. Heichel. I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, you can always um, leave me a comment or you can email me or just drop by my room, room 513, and uh, ask me. There you go.